With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Dr. Jeff Augustine. In this episode, Dr. Augustine discusses refractive surgery, including SMILE, LASIK and PRK. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. Uh, let's talk about SMILE, something that I'm very interested in and something very yeah. exciting. Uh, SMILE stands for Small Incision Lentecular extraction it's it's kind of the even though they've been doing it in europe i guess for you know over 10 years it's kind of the new kid in the block as far as the the u.s even though i guess it was approved in 2016 2017 and then 2018 for astigmatism tell us what smile is walk us through it okay i started working with smile about six years ago we were one of the first uh centers in the united states to start working with smile and we had two lasers. We have one in Cleveland and one in Toledo. And so initially when we started working with it, the energy levels and the skill, the surgical skill set associated with doing the procedure was rather, rather difficult for our surgeons. Um, the energy levels had to be adjusted properly. Each of the particular lasers worked differently. Um, we, one, we had one surgeon go to Toledo and said uh, that that laser was great and dandy. We had an, the same surgeon come to Cleveland and we played with different energy levels to, to remove the lenticle. So as far as the procedure itself, the laser docks to the eye and it, it's a femtosecond laser and it creates different planes in the interstructure of the corneal wall. The cap is created at about 120 microns. Then the, then the assessment is made for the refractive air and it goes down deeper and creates a refractive plane. And then a small port is created where that corneal lenticle is actually removed, sort of like playing the game Jenga, where you pull a piece out, the same, the same, the same uh, physical principles behind that. So the surgeon has to go in, dock the laser, have the laser do its different types of planes in the cornea. And then he goes in with a spatula and slowly dissects out that corneal lenticle. And you mentioned energy before. Of this too much yeah. energy, what's the downside? Well, it can be difficult to remove that lenticle depending on energy levels. And also the uh, post-op post -op, uh, day one outcome may be affiliated with uh, more severe edema and may not have uh, what, you know, the wow factor that the LASIK patient had. So we started out and, and I didn't really uh, embrace SMILE when, we, when I first started out six years ago. The patients weren't coming in with the wow factor at that day one like the LASIK patients were. Um, and so I wasn't embracing it as much as I, you know, I thought I would. And it was also limited to smear back in that time period where we, do, where, where we weren't, weren't able to do uh, the astigmatism patients with, with the myopia. So that was a limited patient population that I worked with. I think the first year I worked with maybe a couple hundred patients. Uh, then the next year, I wasn't really happy with it. It dropped down. And then with the uh, revisions that we had with the energy levels and the expansion of the parameters, then it went up this past year. I've worked with over, let's see, in 2021, I've worked with almost two to 3,000 
eyes. And this year we'll probably supersede it at about 5,000 eyes in regards to smile. If the patients, if the patient's parameters fit the smile, then I have the patients have the smile procedure versus the LASIK procedure at this point. How is the prescription or the amount of lenticle that's removed determined? Basic, it's the basic thing that I, I talked about a little bit earlier today in regards to the size of the optical zone, the, the amount of myopia the patient has, and it's calculated that way. There's a nomogram for it. So I have a sheet that, that I go to and it'll say, uh, this patient's a minus five with uh, one diopter of astigmatism. Then it goes over and tells me the size of the lenticle that'll be removed. Wow, that's it's fascinating. And, and how accurate is it? Uh, right now, the enhancement rate on the, uh, the enhancement rate with SMILE in our practice is 1%. That's a secondary procedure rate. And I believe uh, we're at about 98% 2020 or better. And compared to LASIK versus SMILE for uh, needing enhancement or, or a touch-up, so to speak, as the patients like yeah. to talk about. The uh, enhancement rate for, SMILE, uh, for LASIK patients in our practice is about 4%. But you also have to keep in mind that it's not apples to apples. When we're working with some of our LASIK patients, they may, be, they may be mixed astigmatism with hyperopia. So the enhancement rate may be not comparable. When, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with uh, the smile patients, it's all myopia with astigmatism. So it's hard to compare you know, LASIK and smile on, on secondary procedural rates. I'm sure if we were just working with LASIK patients with just myopia and astigmatism, both SMILE and LASIK would be comparable. And why would somebody have LASIK now over SMILE, which is an easier procedure to do for the surgeon? I guess that depends on the surgeon. See, I, uh, some of our surgeons in our practice um, prefer SMILE over LASIK at this juncture. Now, you may have other practices that don't have quite the experience that we have with SMILE, and they would, they would preference the LASIK procedure. Maybe they don't even have access to a, a Visimax laser. The ones that prefer SMILE over LASIK that have done both, why do they prefer SMILE? Uh, I think the reason is that it's one laser, one step. Interesting. Rather than two lasers, two steps. And what happens if a patient has a corneal scar or has panis, which are these abnormal blood vessels that have been in the cornea for usually from overwearing your contact lenses? Yeah, you have to be really careful with uh, patients with corneal scars because uh, using the Visimax laser, uh, the, femtos, the femtos spots may be blocked. If that's blocked, then it'll create adherences in the interface. So the lenticle will be, will be difficult to remove. When it comes to panis, I have to be careful with those particular patients because I don't want to get an interface bleed, especially if it's superiorly and it could go into that four millimeter incision site. If you do get a bleed, it can be controlled with uh, neosnephrine and uh, compression on that particular area. Um, but I don't, I don't get, I don't get too, I don't get too worried about panis unless it's unless it's severe. I'm more concerned about the scar and also making sure that there's not a lot of oils that are uh, extruded from around the eye when uh, the procedure, excuse me, when the procedure is being done. So if there is oil, why, why, mm -hmm. what's the negative of the a patient of my bombing gland dysfunction and it's producing oil? Well, what that can do is it can block the laser. So it'll block the process uh, and, and it creates a problem with creating that lenticle. So you want to have pristine, you want to have a pristine tear layer as well as cleanliness around the lids and lashes. And the recovery time for each one, LASIK versus SMILE, can you compare that? Uh, recovery times are, uh, well, for instance, you know, I saw about 10 patients this morning, um, five had LASIK, five had SMILE. The recovery is pretty comparable. They're all functional at day one, but just a little bit different approaches in regards to, um, you know, that first week and how to take care of the eye. But functionality, they they were all all fine. Uh, I think 90 percent of my patients this morning were uh, 2020, and uh, both LASIK and Smile. And if there is a scar, is there a degree of how bad the scar is? 
And would you, which, what procedure would you do if the patient does have a, a scar? Uh, I would lean towards the patient undergoing surface ablation or PRK, depending on the severity of the scar. And how about for contact sports? Is there an issue with, uh, with, with smile? No, I tend the patients that are involved with the contact sports, I tend to lean towards, you know, with this point in time, undergoing uh, a smile procedure, if they fit the parameters of it, you know, in years past, um, when I didn't have access to smile, uh, I worked with a fair amount of patients that had, you know, had LASIK without any, any, any problems with that, you know, as far as flap goes, but I'm, I was conscious of it. And how long does the, the smile procedure take? About seven to eight minutes, depending on the surgeon. I work with four different smile surgeons. They're all a little bit different. And, uh, but how much, how long is the laser actually on the eye for? No, the laser's on the eye for about uh, 20 seconds at this point in time. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're probably, we're going to see some, you know, in, as technology gets better, the lasering time, the lasering time will decrease. I believe over in Europe, it's about eight seconds now. And both eyes are done the same day. That's correct. And does the patient feel like they're wearing, I've heard like they, like they feel like they're wearing swimming goggles for maybe 24 hours? No, I, the patients, I'd let them know that, you know, immediately after the procedure, we'd expect them to notice an improvement. You know, it's not Disney World right away, yeah, but they uh, tend, to, tend to do fairly well immediately post-op. We have them uh, go home and we give them Valium and some Benadryl. They go and sleep for a couple hours. Now, do you use Valium for LASIK and smile before the surgery or only if That's somebody's correct. very nervous? Yeah, we use it, we use it uh, before the surgery for all patients, whether it be PRK, smile, or, or cross-linking or anything with that. And what are some of the surgical surgeon pearls that the surgeon is thinking about? Uh, some surgical pearls may be, you know, to be, um, to verbally coach the patient through it. Um, so they able to, uh, talk them through, it makes some sort of verbal anesthesia, uh, our surgeons use also, um, whenever I do a, a, a workup on a patient, I have the technicians kind of take them on a field trip into the laser areas. So they become comfortable with, with that environment. It takes kind of a fear out of the unknown. So it helps reduce anxiety there. Also being meticulous around and how to, uh, surgical pearls to remove the, the lenticle and make sure that there's no um, residual uh, cornea left. So the surgeons look at that carefully, uh, maintaining the integrity of the incision site. So there's no uh, corneal abrasions near that site that can help prevent any ingrowth. Uh, another surgical pearl is washing the interface out. Some of our surgeons wash the interface, some don't. So there's been a, a mild debate on whether to wash in that inside that pocket. And what are some of the side effects that we have to look out for? Uh, some of the side effects may be um, uh, regression uh, that may lead towards uh, having a secondary procedure. Also, um, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think. That, Any that's probably the any bad infections or you know, I haven't, visual I have fluctuations not, or? I, I personally have not seen any infections with smile in our practice. And, uh, but there's always a risk for that. I think, um, you know, I emphasize compliancy with lid hygiene as well as compliancy with utilizing the antibiotics properly. Uh, so I, not, I have not seen uh, any infections associated with the smile procedure in my experience. And the post-op care, is it antibiotic steroids? Is it anything different? Yes. It's exactly the same thing as LASIK. And for PRK, about a week? Yeah, it depends on the severity of the refractive area it may extend the cortical steroid additional week. My understanding is a lot of combat military personnel and uh, police are choosing SMILE over, over LASIK. I have to agree with you. You know, and, and uh, 
So again, also a professional, someone who's a high level athlete and maybe a division one athlete or a pro professional athlete would, th this is obviously uh, preferred over LASIK and how about compared to PRK? Um, I think, you know, if we, if I have the choice, you know, PRK is certainly a, an elegant, fantastic procedure. Um, in, in my experience, I have the patients, you know, with PRK do one eye at a time uh, because the functionality can be, can be very difficult for that first couple weeks. So I, I generally space the PRK patients out uh, um, about a month apart on their eyes so that they can get back to work. They can do, do one eye at a time. Um, I do like PRK. We also do PRK over top of uh, previous LASIK patients for secondary procedures. We don't lift flaps after uh, two or three years out. We do PRK on top. So that prevents the issue regarding uh, epithelial ingrowth. So PRK stands for photorefractive keratectomy. Uh, right. So walk us through now. So we talked about LASIK, we talked about SMILE, and now let's talk about the third corneal refractive procedure, PRK, which is photorefractive keratectomy, which you just started talking about. Walk us through that procedure. Uh, how, first, first thing is, how often is PRK being used compared to LASIK and SMILE? And is it, is it falling out of favor other than like special cases like you were just speaking about a, a couple of minutes ago? Yeah, I think if you look at uh, our particular practice, um, certainly LASIK and SMILE uh, are practice builders. Um, you know, generally PRK patients um, can be a little bit uncomfortable. They have to have more visits uh, to the practice and their, uh, their uh, functionality uh, initially isn't that, uh, uh, doesn't have quite the wow factor of LASIK and SMILE. So with PRK, uh, the epithelium was removed, uh, which is about 50 microns. Then the ablation takes place on the anterior stroma based on the refractive air of the patient. Epithelium's removed in our practice with alcohol. Um, and then a bandage contact lens will be uh, put on the eye the bandage lens has no prescription in it, but prevents the eyelid from uh, squeegeeing across the epithelium and also helps with pain management. I have the patient utilize four different types or four different types of drops in PRK patients. And we also, uh, we also give them some pain meds because it can be a little, it can be fairly uncomfortable initially when having it. Um, I have the patients utilizing an antibiotic, uh, utilizing a uh, cortical steroid, as well as a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, such as Ketorolac. I have the patients uh, utilize the Ketorolac for the first three days, four times a day. I see the patient at day one. I see the patient at day three. I do a bandage contact lens uh, exchange at day three. And I see the patient at day six and seven for the bandage contact lens removal. At that point in time, I start tapering the patient on the cortical steroid at three times a day for a week twice a day for a week, one time a day for a week, over a month's period of time. During that first three days, uh, I have the patient chill the artificial tears in the refrigerator and have them utilize them every two hours while awake. So that seems to help uh, with the discomfort. And I've gotten, it, it, I, I've, managed the, I've managed those patients quite well in regards to their uncomfortability. It just doesn't have the, uh, Years, years ago, PRK was, uh, you know, was the first procedure in the United States that was utilized. And at that point in time, the patients were pressure patched, that we didn't have uh, good pain management strategies. PRK was not, uh, was not um, being overly, overwhelmingly uh, embraced back in the early 90s, how it is today. And today it's a very safe procedure that works very, very well for those certain patients that uh, demand that type of procedure. And what are you using to remove the epithelium? Are you using a laser or are you using something else? We use al alcohol to remove the epithelium. And how difficult is it to get the epithelium off and to get it nice and clean? Uh, it's not difficult at all. It's put in a little chamber and it's wiped with a wax cell. And then after you remove the epithelium, then that's when you bring in the eczema. 
Yeah, they they do they do the whole the patients under the eczema the whole time. And what is the average time you think that a patient needs to be in the contact lens? The average patient is it four days? Is it a week? What do you think? It no, is usually? I'm very conservative when it comes to uh, keeping the bandage contact lens in on the PRK patient. Um, you know, I, I in the past I may have taken it out too prematurely and the epithelium uh, sloughed. So I keep the patients in that contact for six to seven days with one exchange in the middle. And do we, do we ever have to worry about recurrent corneal erosions after PRK? Uh, no, actually, um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, those patients that have recurrent corneal erosion, PRK or PTK uh, is the laser procedure of choice it creates a new basement membrane, so it cuts down on recurrent erosions. I have seen patients, though, that have had recurrent erosions with PRK. It's very rare, very rare. Macu Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. And as far as thinner corneas, is PRK better for a thinner cornea and a higher prescription? Uh, certainly, PRK can be a, uh, a great procedure for thin corneas, but I don't, I, I don't go very on the level of myopia with PRK. I tend to uh, not go with high myopia with PRK due to healing responses. And higher myopia, which procedure would you use with, the, with higher myopia before we get to ICLs? I would lean towards doing a patient with the, either a thin flap LASIK or would be a smile procedure. If they fit, if they can fit the parameters of it, and how high can smile go? Usually, it can go up to minus. It could go up to minus ten. And uh, what kind of thickness of a cornea do you need for that? Well, in order for that lenticle to be removed at a minus ten, it's probably going to be close to 180 microns. So that's a significant lenticular thickness. So in that case, the the you have to do the math. The the cap would be. Uh, 120 micron cap, you then have to remove 180 microns out of the, uh, the center of the cornea and, and still maintain uh, 275 microns at the base. So you'd have to kind of figure out, well, 275, 180 um, plus 120. So you're talking probably about a 600 micron cornea, 120, 180. You're catching me up, you're catching me up on my numbers here. 300, 270. Yeah, I'd have to at least 600 microns. But then I also have to look at the curvature of the cornea too, because I don't want to flatten out that cornea too much when it comes to the, the, uh, the K values. Uh, minus 10, would, it would significantly change the corneal curvature. And the more the curvatures change, the more uh, susceptibility to aberrations. I would, pref I would prefer a patient that's a minus 10 to do an ICL. And how about LASIK? How high would you go with LASIK? Do you feel comfortable? With LASIK, when you start to get to those double digits, that's when I, and a nine and above, I tend to lean towards having those patients do a, a lens-based procedure, such as an ICL. Um, I have worked with, you know, I work with patients minus nine with smile and LASIK, but it all, again, it, became, it depends on the pachymetry of that patient in order to maintain the structure of that cornea and the strength. You know, with, with PRK, patients ask, when can they start watching television? What do you typically tell the patients for something like that? The next day. And how about driving? The they're, they're able to, what, I'm, what, I do, what I do with a PRK patient, I'll have them undergo the procedure on the one eye. And in the meantime, they could wear their normal contact in the opposite eye to correct their vision that way. So that's how they maintain their, their, you know, getting back to work and that type of thing. You know, they can work, they could watch TV, they go on a computer. Uh, PRK wouldn't slow, it isn't slowing them down. How about for driving, any uh, restriction? No. If it's a bilateral PRK, then, then certainly it is. And what are the side effects that we have to worry about for PRK? Well, you're gonna have to be uh, more cautious of infections associated with that. Also, you're going to have to um, be very, you know, meticulous on uh, epithelial assessment 
and understanding how the epithelium heals um, and, and maintaining a compliancy with drop regimens as well as pain management. So let's move over to uh, phacic IOLs or the ICL, uh, the imp implantable lenses for the high prescriptions. You know, patients come in, they have a high prescription, a minus 10, a minus 12, and uh, they want something done, a procedure. How good are these phacic IOLs? And is it something that, that, that it is a reasonable procedure for a patient? Yeah, I'm a big advocate of the ICLs, especially with the new advent of the EVO lens that has the port in the center. So we no longer have to do the, uh, uh, the periphery ergotomy. Also, astigmatism can be addressed now with the toric ICLs. Uh, so I'm a, a, a very strong component to patients undergoing the ICL. The nice thing about an ICL is that if there was an issue with it, it can be removed. It is a material, so it's very predictable as far as um, outcomes go. And the patients uh, generally are, are functional and celebrate vision at that day one post-op because of the dramatic prescription uh, that the patients have. It's a, it's a real life changer. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that the audience understand when I say phacic IOL, it's phacic yeah. intraocular lens. And right. ICL is an implantable columnar lens. Correct, correct. Now, so, an ICL goes, uh, goes behind the iris in front of the natural lens. A, let's say a lens-based procedure, we would remove the lens and replace it that way. So two different interocular procedures. So the, the, the next question, of course, is how often do we have to worry about it causing a cataract and, it's, and touching the lens when the right. surgeon is doing the procedure? The nice thing about the new EVO lens is no periphery ergotomy is needed. Sometimes if you have an aggressive periphery ergotomy, that can, that can spark a cataract. So that, that's been eliminated. Um, the sizing is critically important for the ICL so that it sits in that sulcus properly. So ultrasounds are gonna be very, very important and, and, and getting an idea uh, the size of the eye, the anterior chamber depth so that you can better fit an ICL so it doesn't touch or induce a cataract. If a cataract was to occur with an ICL, the ICL would be removed, the cataract would be removed, and a new lens would be put in its place. And is that something you've seen quite a bit of or not really? Very rare, very rare. Another issue is the rotation uh, of the ICL in, in patients that have high amounts of astigmatism. That sizing has to be critically important because if it rotates out of position, then certainly that can complicate the refractive error of the patient. And how about a multifocal ICL uh, in people over the age of, I guess, 40? Yeah, there's no, there's not a multifocal ICL. I have worked with patients and done monovision ICL, but they, they don't have a multifocal. It, the only multifocal would be uh, an interocular lens, not an ICL. And, and my, 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 uh, I understand that star goes from minus three to minus 15. Uh, is there anything above minus 15 for those patients that are even minus 18, minus 20? Uh, I have worked with patients that are outside those parameters. I think it goes up to actually minus 16, I believe. Okay. Maybe you're right, maybe I'm wrong. But I work with a patient, she was a minus 23, and uh, we put uh, the ICL in a minus 16. And then uh, in a, a month later, we did LASIK on top. And how did she do? Uh, she came in, it's, it's pretty funny because her best corrected visual acuity on a minus 23 was about 20, 30, 20, 40 with those optics. She was a Syrian refugee and she came in very introverted and hardly made any eye contact with me. Within six months of having that procedure, she blossomed into a new person. Really? Yeah, it was fantastic. So that's, that's, that's a tremendous story. Are there any other uh, ICLs uh, that, are, that are approved that don't need, uh, that you don't have to worry about doing a peripheral aerodynamy besides EVO? No, that's, that's the, the only one that I'm aware of. And here in the United States, we only have uh, ICLs for myopia and astigmatism. 
in different countries, they have ICLs for hyperopia and astigmatism. So let's, let's uh, what, besides worrying about a cataract, what are the side effects that we have to worry about ICLs? Well, we talked about rotation, right? Yes. We talk, and, and we also, the other thing that we have to be cautious of is interocular pressure during that initial post-operative period. Because if any of the, let's say, uh, the, the lens moves forward, the EVO may be blocked by a viscoelastic agent, then the pressure can elevate quickly. And what's the post-operative uh, period like and what kind of medication drops do they need? Uh, it's very, very similar to uh, a cataract surgery. We have the patient, we have a combination drop that has Ketorolac in it. Uh, prednisone in it and uh, antibiotic in it. And it's generally three times a day for the first week, one time a day for the next two weeks. You have to be caught, these patients have to be a little bit cautious like catar cataract patients with bending over and lifting, that type of thing for the initial uh, post-operative period. Is that drop compounded? Yes. And where, where, what, do you happen to know where you, get, where you guys get that from? Offhand? No, I... No, I, I forget the name of the, the company that does that. I'm sorry. No, I mean, that's pretty cool, though, that you put all three drops in one bottle and make it easy for the patient. Yeah, it's great. We give it, we dispense it to them as well. You know, from, we have a, we have an ambulatory surgery center that's connected to the LASIK center. So, you know, they're right, they're right next door to us. And that's where they're given the drop. Now let's talk about someone who had cataract surgery. So we were talking about before non-cataract surgery, younger people, right. and now people get older, they need cataract surgery and there's great options for them as far as uh, implants, as far as multifocal right. and premium IOLs. Can you talk about those and, and your experience? Yeah, the, the, um, the lens that I've been leaning towards uh, uh, lately is called the panoptics lens. It's a multifocal interocular lens, and it's uh, it's kind of the it's been our go-to lens because it's it has given us the most functional vision, both distance and near, without uh, significant aberrations. So Who that's our that go-to. Uh, uh, might be Bausch and Lomb. I'm not sure who okay. makes it off the top of my head. Okay, so uh, okay. Be, what, what's the what's the, the what's the advantage? It could be an outcome based one. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what's the advantages of it? You, were, uh, I, I interrupted you. Uh, because it's giving the most usable vision in this zone here, as well as good good distance vision and having less aberrations at night. So let's talk about laser assisted cataract surgery using the femto in cataract surgery. Talk about the pros and cons of that. Uh, I don't work a lot on that cataract side and we, we no longer use that particular uh, laser-based, um, uh, we don't, we don't, we no longer use that. We use Wiley tends to use uh, just FACO only. And what do you think the future is? You think we're going to see bilateral cataract surgery? Yeah, I think that's being done already, some around the United States. Also, you're seeing um, um, having um, instead of having a, a formal anti uh, ambulatory, ambulatory surgery center. A lot of these uh, cataracts are being office based done now. And uh, the advantage and disadvantage of it doing office based versus ambulatory. I think the office space may be a little bit more, um, maybe more convenient, maybe more economical uh, to the to the practice. Um, we, we've we've thought about that, that idea, but um, we're still you know we're still leaning towards Wiley tends to in our in our surgeries are, are in ambulatory surgery center and he's he's staying with that. And uh, have you I think guys... that I think those questions I think that'd be better addressed by the cataract surgeon than me. And you think how long into have you guys started doing bilateral cataract surgery where you are yet? And uh, how long until you think that may be something that we'll, we'll see universally throughout the US? Um, we have not done bilateral cataract surgery, but we do bilateral uh, lens replacement surgery because it's, it, it can, it's a different because of insurance-based. And, and so I, we have to do it. 
for bilateral cataract surgery, I guess we have to really worry about endophthalmitis. Yes, I would think that would be that would be something. That, that would be something I guess we would worry about. Well, you know, this has been very comprehensive, uh, Jeff. You've been uh, very generous with your time and you, you have tremendous knowledge in this area uh, of surgical procedures. Is there anything that I left out that, uh, that you'd like to, that, that we should talk about? Mm. I, I just, um, you know, I, we talked highly about SMILE but I, I, LASIK and PRK are certainly uh, fantastic. They're all fantastic. They're all fantastic. The technology in, in PRK, LASIK and SMILE is awesome. Um, you know, there's some distinct advantages to, to each of those types of procedures. Uh, I celebrate all three of those procedures and um, you just, I'm looking forward to, you know, embracing the new technologies that continue to evolve in the laser vision world uh, from when I started to where I am today. It's been, it's been an evolution like monkey to man and it's just been a fantastic ride. It must be wonderful to have such happy patients. Yeah, I have a great job. <laughs> I have a great job. C considering to be able, you're able to remove a visual handicap, change a patient's life for the better. Uh, that's, a, that's a great career. I mean, you talk I love, about I love that. the celebration of vision. I love the celebration of vision. Day one post-op is it. I mean, you talked about that one patient who was my, over minus 20 and her whole personality yeah. changed. Is there any other patient that you could tell us about that may stand out in your mind that you just the procedure just changed their life? Well, for instance, I saw, uh, I did a workup on a patient. He came in, he was a, he's a football coach, high school football coach. And his refractive error was minus 50. Minus 50? Minus 0.50. Oh, half. Right. Half diopter. Half diopter. Or not 50, but a half diopter. Okay. So I, I go, are you really, you know, is this really going to be significant for you? We have to look at the risk benefit ratio. Do you wear your glasses all the time? He's like, yeah, I, I want to see my players and it's night and I can't see good. And I said, do you wear contacts? He's like, nope, just glasses only for nighttime driving. I said, the other net, you don't wear them. He goes, no. He goes, but I want the procedure. I saw him this morning, and he, he was about 20, 30, uncorrected, maybe 20, 25, uncorrected. And I saw him this morning. He had his procedure done yesterday, and he's 2015 this morning. And I go, was this worth it? Is this better for you? And he goes, I love it. It's fantastic. So you go from that extreme to this extreme. That's wonderful. And you yeah. know, that's a real type per A personality, a football coach with a minus a half and he wants, and he wants a procedure. Wants a pro yeah, yeah. And which procedure was, was done on him? I, I, you might've said he, it, but he I had, missed it. He had a, he had a, uh, he had a LASIK procedure done. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if the, the lenticle, the lenticle size on a half diopter would be, um, to, I don't even think it, I don't think smile even does a minus a half. It would be too thin. So interesting. Such a great story. Well, Dr. Augustine, if people want to find out more about you or they want to get in contact with you and your clinic, yes. how can they do that? So you could go to Clear Choice LASIK, uh, clearchoicelasikcenter.com or you can reach us at 440-740-0400. Uh, there's, you can, that's the easiest way to get, just Google us or Google, uh, or go, yeah, just easily Google us. We have uh, two locations. One's in Brexel, Ohio, and the other one's in Toledo. It's called the Toledo LASIK Center. And our surgeons go to and from. The surgeons I work with are, are top notch. I work with Sean McBafna, William Wiley, and uh, Kathy, Kathy G. Uh, and then we also work with uh, another ophthalmologists by name of uh, Arjun Hura. They're all fantastic surgeons. Uh, I've been, and I've been working with those guys for decades. So yeah, it's, you're in a good place when you come see us. Well, thank you, Dr. Augustine. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and this great information that the public really wants to know about and a lot of optometrists need to know about it. Uh, this is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. Thank you for watching.
OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.